The name of this is, it's got, I got my license, now what? And here's the thing, situation. We spent a lot of time getting people to get a license, and then, you know, if, what do they do after that? That's what this is, this is all about. Okay, that's a little bit about me. I've been an amateur radio operator, as, as um, Randy said, since 2008. I'm a dedi I've been a dedicated radio hobbyist since I was a kid. I was one of those ones that uh, built a little cr crystal radio. We did, we built a little radio out of headphone and antenna and a ground. Yep. And for the detector, we used a razor blade, a safety pin, and a piece of lead pencil. And that little thing worked. And that was fascinating. And I, I, that has changed my life. I have been a radio, radio enthusiast ever since. And um, I work, um, we work for a group called Wilburn Emergency Amateur Radio Net. It's a group of church. Uh, churches, local churches in the area. They provide emergency communication. Um, I also work at a food bank down in uh, Tucker. We have a radio station, amateur radio station down there, and we can contact the other food banks in the Northeast. And I say I spent 20 years in the Air Force, and it was in communications and radio. And I'm a confirmed radio geek. I think most of us here are. Okay, why this particular presentation? Because I have a passion for new hands, because I was one, my, one, one myself once, and uh, I was one that had a background, and I was thinking, uh, there's a little bit of a lot after I got my, my license, what am I going to do now? And that was one of the reasons I came to Garth and got affiliated with the club, and I knew uh, immediately that I was going to become active in it. And unfortunately, you know, the statistics are pretty, pretty, pretty bad, because half the people who get their license never get on the air. That's where we come in. Hopefully we, we can help some of these new hands get, get active in the hobby and, and, get, and enjoy the, the, the thrill of radio that we have. Okay, please do interrupt. I love questions. Um, so anytime you have a question, just raise your hand and uh, I guess somebody will take a, a mic over there. and. Uh, um, we hope that, that you will ask plenty of questions. Okay, and the only stupid question is the one that you don't ask. Okay, here again, people spend a lot of time getting, getting a radio license. They take the time to study. They, they many attend what we call a hand grammar or a one day event, like uh, Dave is the moon put in doing here. They take the test and about half of them never get on the air. Yes? How do you know that? It's one that's been bandied around. I think that that may just come from the AWRL. I'm not 100% sure on that. Yeah, it's, it's worse than that, actually. It may be. But man, what a waste. Somebody gets their license, and I know people like that. I know of one person who got their ham license, went down to, to the store and bought a radio, put it in their closet, never charged the battery, never programmed it, never got on the air. And what good is that radio doing? What good is that license doing? Okay, so if you have your license, and this gentleman back here, we want you to succeed. And even if you've been a, been a ham radio operator for years, we want you to succeed and to have fun with the hobby. Okay, now this is one of the most profound statements I had ever heard about amateur radio. An amateur radio license is a license to learn. And this is by Dan Henderson, N1ND, of the Amateur Radio Relay League. He came down last year to Ham Jam and uh, made that statement. And I tell you, that has stuck with me. Uh, and hopefully we're all learning. Um, I'm one that, that tries to learn something every day about amateur radio. I don't radio geek. Okay, the first thing after you get your license is get a hold of a radio. This particular young lady here, I think, is 10 years old, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, young kids get, in, get involved in the hobby, and we want to keep them going. Okay, the types of ham radios. Now, most of us know this, but for those of us who are, who are new, um, there's a base station, a mobile radio that you, would, that you would put in your car, and an HT, or handy talkie. 
which is one of these little portables that we have some people around here that have. Okay, base stations. Nowadays, they some of them will put up to 200, 200 watts. The more power, yeah, it goes further. It is generally meant for in-home use, but yeah, you can take it out to out to the field and, and we hope you do. Um, some have all amateur, major amateur radio bands. I have one at home that uh, I use, and it, it does uh, HF, VHF, and UHF, and I love it. Most of these are going to need an external power supply. I worked with one radio the other at, uh, I think it was Field Day, that had its own internal power supply. Nice. But you will need an external antenna. A mobile radio. Okay, that's designed for the vehicle use. Can also be used in the home. Why not? As long as it sees the 12 or 13 volts that it needs, it doesn't really care where it goes. Um, and you, some of them will put up to about 50 watts out, and they'll need an external power supply. And again, you're going to need an external antenna. Okay, the HT or Handy Talkie. We've got several around here, and I did bring a couple with me in case anyone is interested. Um, they're extremely portable. Most of them are rugged. And they can cover one to four bands, which is nice. I saw, I had a friend that has one that has four bands in it, and I thought, wow, that's really cool. Um, it's a complete fun functioning station in one device. And when you're brand new, that's usually a way to, that most uh, most of us will go. They'll start out with one of these HTs. And uh, they can be used in the home, in the car, or in the field. And they can be your base station. My, my, uh, <laughs> My portable, my mobile radio is actually an HT, and I have an HT at home as one of my base stations. Why not? You can make them do triple duty. Okay, most fans are going to buy an HT. Um, it's a small thing. It's battery powered. Now the maximum I think I've seen out of these is eight watts. Most of them run about five. Some will run about four, and they come with this rubber ducky antenna. That's what it's called. That's the stock antenna that comes with it. Um, it's not generally very effective. Usually you're going to lose about half your power going out. So if you have a 5 watt radio, it's only going to put out about 2.5 watts as it goes through that antenna. So you got to get a better antenna for it. Okay, now when you get your license and you're looking for a radio, you want to get the best radio that you can. Um, it's, and I recommend the dual band radio that will do 2 meters and 70 centimeters. Look for one that is intuitive to use. Now I, I have um, some of the one of the Chinese radios, and I do not find it intuitive. Uh, most of the ones that you buy from Japan, uh, usually will from the Japanese companies, are usually intuitive. I can't say they all are, but most of them are. And you may want to avoid some of the cheapies because of that. However, if price is a major concern. They get some of these uh, little Baofeng radios now. I saw them on, uh, I think it was Amazon. They're about $25, $26. You can't beat the price. Now, if you have, if you uh, get a decent radio and want a second cheapy radio, hey, if it doesn't work, you, you get it home, you've got a cheap radio. If you lose it, who cares? If it doesn't work, who cares? Throw it away and get another one. It's a lot cheaper than you'd have to re have repaired. Now, you can ask a hell of a fellow ham for help and we'll always be glad to help you on that. Okay, antenna choices. When you get one of these HTs, you want to replace it with a, what they call a whip antenna for portable use. And if you go down to the to the uh, amateur radio store, and we'll get a little bit about that a little bit later, uh, they'll, they'll get you, they'll steer you right. An external antenna, obviously one will yield better results. Um, it can be as simple as a mobile antenna on a pizza tin. This was my first external antenna. Mm -hmm. hey. You know, it's not pretty, but it works. I spent twenty dollars for the for the uh, for the antenna, and uh, the pizza pie with pizza pin was one that we had that was old and beat up. So I bought a new one and kept the old one. Hey, they work. Now you want to get that up as high as you can. You'll need an adapter for your radio, but there and we have those. Those are those are easy to come by. You just put it up as high as you can. If you have a two-story house, go upstairs. Because the higher you are, the more, the better your signal is going to get out, the better you're going to be able to hear people. Um, so it, it works. Get your antenna as high as you can. 
Okay, there's a there's a picture of one of the whip antennas that you can get. Um, oh yeah, this is one. This is called a ground plane antenna. This is meant for external use. My first amateur radio construction project was a homemade ground plane antenna. And you know the thing worked. It looked ugliest in it worked. Um, this is what this one is called a J pole. This is a nice one to have. Um, I've had, in fact, I have one of these at home, and it's it's surplus. Um, anybody's interested, uh, let me know. Uh, it, it's called a J pole because it looks like a J. <clears throat> there are single band, and I think there's some dual band ones too. This is one I like. This is a portable J pole antenna. It's a foldable one. I have one in my bag down here. If you're interested, after the meeting, come up and I'll show you how it works. I can throw this up in a tree anywhere. In fact, during a storm, when we have bad storms, a thunderstorm in the area, I'm not going to hook up my external antenna. I'm going to use that on, and hook it up in my in my office. And that's and that way I'm, I'm not much less uh, likely to, to get a lightning strike. These things are great. You can go just about anywhere. Throw it up in a tree, and you're on the air. Okay, buy, buying a radio, buying new or used. Okay, well, there's, been, there's advantages to both. Let's take a look at buying new. Usually, you're going to get everything you need to get on the air. Um, the new units are programmable, which means if you, if you move from one area to another, you can change the frequencies. Uh, you're always going to have the latest features when you get one of these radios. And the bad news is, you're going to have to program it. Um, and there, there are ways to we'll get out. We'll talk a little bit about that. Buying used can be cheaper. I bought, uh, actually, it was a friend that bought me a radio that uh, he got at, uh, I think it was a, at a ham fest. And he paid $50 for it. It's dual band. It was an older radio. But uh, it still worked. I gave it to my wife. And she's using it. Obviously, when you get something like that, you're not going to get a warranty not usually a big deal because if it works there at a, at a ham fest or whatever or you go to somebody's home and, and get it it's going to work for for years uh if you're buying used hopefully you'll get a chance to try before buying um you may not have a manual or other accessories obviously if you get if you buy a radio and it's got the manual with it uh, you're you're much better off and it's usually it may be an indication that the uh, individual you're, you're buying it from has taken care of the radio. Um, and again, here's a good thing to do is to buy some from someone you know or somebody that has a good reputation. Uh, for example, if you go on eBay, uh, you see somebody there that you know that, that's, that's, that's an honest, reputable dealer, that may be the best place to do. And again, asking a more experienced hand will be beneficial to you. Okay, where to buy radios? You want the new ones. Okay, Ham Radio Outlet is down on Buford Highway, just across the, the uh, county line into uh, DeKalb. You go up the little ridge and you look on the left, and there's Ham Radio Outlet. Um, they do sometimes have used equipment. Probably not HTs, but hey, you never can tell. Uh, there are many reputable dealers online. I've seen a bunch of them, and uh, there's some that I completely trust. There are very few of them on at advertising them radio magazines that I would not trust. Okay, check your local clubs. Um, if, for example, uh, those of you who have the, uh, what they call a reflector from GARS, people off, on there often sell their, wanted to sell, sell a radio, you might be able to find a, a good deal on some of those things. Uh, eBay, again, used, you have to be careful, make sure that you get the right person. Craigslist, use the same thing. And estate sales. Um, I got a couple of things from an estate sale. Hey, usually they're, you're, you're going to find a, a pretty good deal with some of those. What brand? I've often been asked this question. I would say try before you buy if possible. Um, ask your fellow hands and look for online reviews. If you type in, for example, you want to look at a radio, um, say for example, ID 5100, 51A. All right, you type that in your, your browser and type in the word review and you'll find a bunch of places that come up that will give you um, reviews from people who own one or have owned one. 
uh, eham.net is one of the ones I know that, that has a, a lot of reviews on there. And uh, you can find something that you like. Okay, this is my personal recommendation. For those of you who want to buy a, a brand new radio, a brand new HD, uh, I do personally recommend the FT60R for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's got a fairly good price. It is not one of the, the cheapy radios, and yet it's not a $300 radio. It's about intermediate. I think it's about 150 somewhere in that area. Uh, this radio has been around for a long time. It is easy to use. It is what I, I call intuitive. In other words, you can figure it out. Some of the radios you get, you have no clue, and you get no documentation, so, okay, what do I do? This is one, and number one, I get the main reason, if you get one of these radios, I can program it for you easily, because I have a program system in both of my uh, computers, and all I need to do is just pop it in there, and you can, you're ready to go. My daughter has one of these radios, and I think I like it more than she does. Okay, you get a radio, a new one, you've got to program it. Uh, there's no way of getting around that. Um, there's a couple of ways to do that. One is manually. That can be time consuming, especially if you have one of these 200, 300, 300 channel radios, you're going to be at it for a while. The good, the good pop thing about that is you're going to know how to program your radio. And if you're ever stuck in an emergency, you can program it on the fly. Happened to me once, um, I was at um, the uh, Memorial Day Parade, and I had the wrong frequency in my radio. It isn't working. Oh, I got the wrong frequency in there. Okay. So, yeah, okay, pull it out, program it, and we're done. There's a program called Chirp. Um, you can find that on, on the web. It's free, um, but not everybody can figure it out. It took me actually going to a program similar to this that somebody showed me how to use it. Now I can do that. There's a company called RT Systems. They're an expensive thing. They cost about $50, but it works very well and you get it with a cable. And there's a picture of RT Systems in their software. It does make it very easy. I have one for just about every radio that we have in our house except the one that um, is too old to, uh, to even have one. But I do personally recommend that the RT systems. Now, if you buy the cheapy, like the Valfang radios, you have to be very careful. You've got to get a programming cable. Some of them are counterfeit. They will not work with the Valfang radios. The ones that come with RT systems work. I know because they work. They work for me. Okay. There's frequencies. You're going to have two different kinds of frequencies to put in your radio. The simplex ones. That's the send and receive are on the same frequency. For example, the 2 meter calling frequency is 146.520. It is simplex. You're going to talk on that frequency and you're going to listen on that frequency. Um, you've got to make sure that, well you want to make sure anyway, that you have the simplex frequencies programmed into your radio so that you can talk on simplex whenever you need to. Uh, it's nice, it's handy when you want to have a more private conversation because Generally, people don't listen to the simplex frequencies. And so you have a little bit more of a privacy. And then there are repeater ones. You send on one frequency, and you receive on the other. The difference between the send and receive frequencies is known as the offset, and is allocated by agreement. Um, and there are special parts of, of the handbands for each. There's a picture of a, re of a repeater. And you notice the little car on the left it's transmitting on frequency A, and it's going up to the repeater. And it's going through what's called the duplexer. And in other words, it's going to, whatever uh, the uh, one on the left sends out on frequency A, is going to go to the repeater and go instantaneously out on frequency B. So when the one on the right returns, he's transmitting on frequency A, and the other car is listening on frequency B. You can use or repeaters, it shows it with cars, you can use it with HTs, or you can use it with base stations, it doesn't matter. Works the same way. But you want to make sure that you get the repeater frequencies in the area. Now we want to find these frequencies. Yeah, right. Okay. It's going to do, what you program in your radio is probably going to depend a lot on your location, the terrain, and antenna height. If you're like me behind a hill, 
you may not be able to pick up everything with um, with just a little simple handheld. You're probably going to have to have some kind of an external antenna. But it really depends on the on the on the system. There is one. There's a couple of stations in Jasper, Georgia, that you can actually talk from from around here on a handheld. Why? Because they're 3,000 feet up. Yeah. Okay. They make great reviews. And boy, in, a, in an emergency situation, those things are going to be fantastic. Okay, the American Radio Relay, Relay League is the big organization that protects our frequencies. They put out a repeater book every year. You don't need to get a brand new repeater book because they don't normally change that much, but you can find the frequencies in, in your area. You look it up by state and look up your local communities and you can find the repeaters and generally it's pretty accurate. Um, there's also several sites on the internet. I think it's radioreference.com is one that has a, a number of, of them in there. And a club website. So you look up the GARS website, go to GARS.org, and you have a whole list of repeater frequencies in there. In fact, if those of you who got the GARSette, there was a little um, blurb in there that had the repeater frequency, all the repeat, GARS repeater frequencies in there. So if you go to other clubs in the, in the local area, you can pick up their frequencies as well. And uh, you can also get another hand. Okay, one thing you want to do is get an Elmer. Wait, wait a minute, not this Elmer. Ah, okay, what's an Elmer? In ham radio circles, an Elmer is a mentor. You need to have somebody there that's going to help you uh, along in the, in the hobby. Now, I was able to, to get through the, the test myself, and was able to pass the test, and there are several times I've needed Elmer. I've had different Elmers for different situations. And that's the person to go to go to for help and advice. And um, many clubs have an Elmer program, like uh, like ours. We have a great Elmer program here. Now, one of the things is you come to the meetings and you look around, and there are a whole bunch of Elmers out here. We have people who um, are so experienced and have been in amateur radio for so long that they have QSL cards from Marconi. <laughs> So yeah, you know they've got they've got experience. <laughs> okay, there is my email address, and I will always be willing to help anyone I can. And if I can't help you, I will find someone who can. Okay, you got your license, you got your radio, and you got it all programmed. Well, what else can I do is as a new ham radio operator? Number one, join a club. That's why we're here at Garbs, okay? Because you get you get uh, an opportunity to speak with other hands. You get to have programs like this every month, and uh, you get to learn things. Um, again, Garbs.org is the is the URL for that. You get to know your fellow hands. Now, one thing you can do is locate books. You can get them at Ham Radio Outlet. You can get them on awrl.org. You can find, they have books for sale. Um, the internet, or sometimes even the local library will have books on amateur radio. Um, join the American Radio Relay League. Why? Because they're the ones that protect our frequencies. Uh, we, we have uh, operating privileges, and we, we don't pay anything for them. If, you're, if you want to start a radio station or a TV station, you're going to pay big bucks to for the frequency that you're going to be transmitting on. We don't pay anything. We pay by public service. And the American Radio Relay League is the one that is protect, helping us protect our frequencies. And then, of course, learn by doing. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. We all do. You look at everyone in the audience. We have a brand new ham back there. Every one of us has been a brand new ham at one time. Every one of us has had to make a first contact. So we're all been through it, and I have never found, well, very rarely, put it that way, have I ever found a ham who would not help. All right, getting on the air. You program your radio to the repeater and the frequencies, and the repeaters are going to cover a larger area. Why? Because they're up higher, they have more power, they got bigger antennas. Here's one of the things that I, that I found out. When you get your radio, listen, listen, listen. Get on the on the GARS net, 
Um, we have one on Monday nights. Um, the Lilburn Emergency Amateur Radio Net has one Sunday nights at 7 o'clock. Everyone is welcome to participate. We listen to how, how they're done, and uh, when you feel comfortable, break in there and uh, join the conversation. Monitor the local nets and other con so that you know exactly what's going on. So you put your radio, for example, on the GAR's main frequency and listen. Find out who's on the air. You hear somebody that you know or you think you want to talk to, go and talk with them. Oh, that first QSO. Oh, boy, is that fun. What you, what the thing you do is, you do, like I'm going to put, I put my own call sign in here. You just get on to your radio and say, in my case, I would say KJ4 CMY monitoring. Obviously, you use your own call. That way you don't get me into trouble. <laughs> or you can just say K, KJ4 CMY listening. Or just throw out your call sign. Say KJ4 CMY. Don't be afraid to tell someone this is your first time or that you're new. We have all been there. We use plain English, especially on VHF and UHF frequencies. So you're not going to get very much stuff on there that you're not going to understand. You have to ID every 10 minutes and at the end of a conversation or a QSO. Now, okay, so let's say you have a, you have a friend that you, that's on the air named Jack. And um, you don't even have to identify your station when you, or your call sign when you get on the air. You can say, hi Jack, are you there? And then Jack comes back to you and talks. As long as you ID every 10 minutes at the end of your conversation, you're within the law. Most ham radio operators will throw out their call sign at the beginning of a conversation. Um, it's not necessary, but it's it's kind of the way they do it. But if you're talking to a friend, and you know and you know that that particular friend is on the air, yeah, why not? Okay, guards activities, not first guards, guards. It, in some ways, it's intimidating because it's a big club. But on the other hand, it's good because there's a big club because there's always somebody there that you can meet and, and get to know. Some of the activities, and I didn't put them all down. I, when, when I went through this this afternoon, I, I put a bunch of more in there, and I, I got on the way here and I thought, uh-oh, I forgot this and I forgot that. Let me just go through some of them. Tech Fest we have, and that's a chance where we, uh, it's, it's, it's GARS, a uh, ham fest, it's called a ham fest, but it doesn't, it's not like a regular ham fest, it's more of an educational experience. Very good, very informative. Uh, field day, a wonderful opportunity to get on the air. Whether you just got your license or you've been licensed for 50 years, there's uh, always a place for you to get on there. Satellites in the park is a fun one. We're actually, we'll get out with our, our equipment and uh, we'll, we'll talk to people via satellites. Um, the dog show. Okay, uh, and I, I can't push this enough, and I know uh, John will <laughs> back me up on this. The dog show is a fun thing to do. If you've never been on the air, never been on the net, this is a great opportunity to come. It is not hard work. Um, you sit down most of the day, and you probably won't have to get on the radio every, every 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, it is a lot of fun. You get to work. Uh, you get to be on the net. And again, that's very low power. If you make a mistake, who cares? Um, and get active in the club. Um, make it a point. I'm going to. I'm, I'm joining guard. I'm going to be here every month. I'm going to get on the nets. I'm going to be in their activities. Now, one of the things that I have tried to do lately, and I've not see not failed in several months, is to introduce myself to someone I don't know. That's probably the hardest thing about guards is there's so many people in here. I do not know everybody's name. So if you're new, you're probably in the same situation. Well, okay, for those of you who are new, introduce yourself. <clears throat> hey, I'm David, KJ4, CMI, just got my license. Please to meet you. If you've been here since the club was organized and you see someone you don't know, hey, I'm David, KJ4, CMI, pleased to meet you. Get to know people you don't know. That's the, the best way I know of, of, of really getting yourself in, in, into the club. Okay, the GARS workshop. Now, this is meant for, for new hands. And I put this up, I clipped this out of the, the, uh, the website, and unfortunately, it wasn't quite up to date when I did it. 
But um, the next show is coming up is next week, right here, same time, same station. And we're going to talk about Morse code keys. Now, the nice thing about this workshop is it is geared towards new hands. It is an activity, not like you get up here and listen to me blather for, for half an hour. But you will get an opportunity to talk. If you have questions, they will usually do a short presentation, and then any questions you have, you raise your hand and say, I got a question. What does this radio do? They'll be glad to help you. It's just a great thing, and I try to support it as much as I can. Any questions? Okay. Comments? How are we on time? Good. Okay. Dave, David, I had a comment. Yes. Um, on the repeaters, on the repeater frequencies on Android, don't know Apple, but on Android, there's one called Repeater Book. Yes. Right. Completely free. It uses your GPS to figure out where you are. It tells you all the repeaters around you on any of the different bands. So you can find a 10 meter repeater, a 6, 1 and a quarter, whatever you're looking for. Yeah. And it'll tell you D Star, uh, Fusion, etc. So it's a, it's a nice little resource you, you didn't mention. That is another resource. I, yes, I, I did mention. I need to put that in there. Yeah. Let me, let me get yeah. some, some, some comments from him since we have the time. This one here is from N3PAQ. He says, so what makes a good first radio? It depends greatly on two things. What will you use the radio for and your budget? Some other comments? Yeah, Dave? Well, I just wanted to say, since you had mentioned uh, the dog show coming up, the next uh, poly event where you can use your radios will be Jamboree on the Air. Jamboree on the Air, as uh, Steve had mentioned earlier, is a great scouting event where we have scouts come in. A lot of them go for the radio merit badge class, and then we help get them on the air and make a contact. So it, it can help you or coach you through what it takes to make that first contact by watching someone else and helping them. I did that one a couple of years ago. I really felt bad I could not make it this year because my wife was was, was uh, home recovering from surgery and I, I missed a number of events, but I, I had so much fun the year I did come out. I was able to get on the air and uh, talk to several um, other places that were doing Joda. In fact, one of them was in New York City, the friendliest group of people I've ever met. And they had a, they had a scout group there. We got our the scouts that came out, and they talked to the scouts that were there that were, were not were, inter were just being introduced to amateur radio. It was a lot of fun. There's a whole bunch of activities, and I missed I missed about half of them. But you just keep your eyes on the on the Gar's website. Listen to what's going on in the meetings, and uh, we'll make sure that you get that you know about all these activities. Okay, a couple other comments. Sometimes a local rig, rig is the best choice for a first rig because of the location and the altitude of the local repeaters. In my case, I probably would have done better with a mobile than, a, than an HT because I'm behind the hill and the guards repeaters are, uh, <coughs> sometimes I, some I can't get them all without an external antenna. Okay, new gear always has more features than the previous generation of radios. Sometimes these features are genuinely advanced and make amateur radio much better. The best way to learn about how to operate your new rig is to read the manual. Oh yeah, very good one. <laughs> now some of the manuals leave a lot to be desired, but that's the best way to do that. And that's one of the things I always tell New Ham. Read the manual, reread it, and read it again. And I <laughs> Not the Balfang. However, with the Balfang, there are uh, excellent manuals that have been privately produced. In fact, there's one called the Chinese Documentation Project, and there was like a 70 page out of that thing. Yeah, really, very good information on that. Okay, don't be afraid to experiment. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Join your local amateur radio club. That's hopefully why we're here. This is the best and fastest way to get your questions answered by people who live in the same area and have done the same things for the first time, just like you are doing now. Okay, there are a lot of things you can explore. The healthiest thing you would do to start thinking of your HT as an accessory to your shack, rather than the main element. Start saving up for the big rig. One of the one of the all mode all band radios would probably be a, a good place to start. Did you know that with um, your your uh, tech license, you can get on HF? There is a 200 kilohertz segment of the 10 meter band that is 
that is set aside and allows technicians to get on. I, my, left, my wife loves it because she's a tech. ARRL has a fine set of books on many topics. They have one for beginners you, that you might find interesting, entitled Getting Started with Ham Radio. Covers a variety of topics that should be interested to you. Hey, David. Yes. What's a corger? A what? On that last uh, screen, what's a corger? Oh, that's K0, K... Zero RGR. <laughs> I thought maybe some of the new folks didn't understand because it doesn't look like a zero to me. Okay, well, yeah, they usually slash it, but that is a zero. <laughs> okay, any ham radio worth of salt needs the ARRL and radio handbook. Um, you can make ham fest load up on ham mags from the 60s. Sometimes people bring in used magazines. That's a great way to, to start. Um, and some, they mentioned some of the older ones, too. Um, the way I do it is to go to bed an hour before, so before the wife and read and sock up on the info. If you have an interest in home brewing, it's only natural. You'll be picking on everything ham radio. Okay. Hey, hey, so a lot of people have brought their old AWR on the handbooks here as giveaways. So if you have a new one and an old one and you don't want the old one anymore, bring it in for a new ham. Yeah. Most times you'll find the information in an older manual relevant. Reading is good. Now, oh, the internet has a lot of stuff about ham radio you can read. Now, I, I like to look at that, and I'm a YouTuber. And you know what? There are tons of interesting things on amateur radio on YouTube. Yeah, I mean, if you just go to YouTube and type in amateur radio, yeah, you'll find thousands of video, videos on there. And I've, I don't think I've ever come across, I come across some boring ones, but most of them are pretty good. And you'll soon find the ones that will help you. There is a, yeah, Dave Casper, the one that you mentioned down there, he does have a whole series on a beginning amateur radio. Um, don't plan to be an expert next week or next year or even the next decade. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Um, if there's any questions, let me know if you want to talk to me after a week. like it.